Well, we're continuing our study in the Gospel of John, so turn me in your Bibles to John chapter 8, and we're in the middle of a section in which Jesus has made the great declaration, I am the light of the world. I am the light, the only light, the exclusive light. He brings truth into darkness, and the world is very dark. I read a story a while back about a farmer walking in his field and he looked up and he saw a beautiful eagle soaring high above. And as he watched, the eagle's flight became more and more erratic. It was caught his attention. So he kept watching and after four or five minutes, he watched the majestic bird fall out of the sky into the middle of his field. Curious, he ran over to where the bird was laying and he realized that the eagle was dead. So he turned him over, tried to figure out why. And he saw that the eagle had grasped a weasel as it was coming down to get its next meal. It clutched a weasel in its talons and had flown up into the sky But the weasel, in turn, to not be undone or go down without a fight, had in turn dug its claws into the belly of the great bird. And as the bird soared high and high above the earth, its blood was gushing out. It was literally bleeding to death. And as I thought about this story, I thought, what a great picture of the sinner. They think they're doing well and they're soaring high. When in fact, sin is literally bleeding them to death. And ultimately, there will be a great fall. The inescapable judgment of God Himself. And in our passage this morning, when we're looking at John 8, 21 through 30, we'll see that there is only one escape for the wrath of God and from the wrath. Of God. And as you remember from a context, Jesus has been speaking to these crowds. Right? It's been the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And we've come here to the, the eighth day of the feast, which is the Sabbath day of rest after a week of celebration. And Jesus has been in the, the temple. He's been in the court of women. And he, he's, there's, there's crowds all around Him. And that's where he made his great declaration about being the light, the only light, the only bearer of truth and clarity in a dark world. And if you remember, as we discussed last week, the Pharisees in the midst of this crowd challenged Jesus. They challenged his character, they challenged his qualifications. This began a, an ongoing discussion back and forth between them in the midst of the crowd. You see, they understood when he declared, I am the light of the world, that this was a messianic reference. They understood the, the passages in the Old Testament that spoke of the Messiah being a light and a light to the Gentiles. But what happens is, is The Pharisees demonstrate their hard-heartedness. They demonstrate their unbelief. They were the ones who persisted and prided themselves on being righteous, on being good. They believed they were going to God's kingdom. They were going to heaven based off of their religious works and their, their attempts of self-righteousness. They thought they were better than everyone else because they weren't sinners like everybody else. They were good people. And good people go to heaven, right? That's what they would say. And as we're going to continue this dialogue this morning in, in verses 21. And honestly, we're going to see how far we get. There's so much in this passage. But I want you to see, first of all, a warning to all unbelievers in verses 21 through 23. Then I want you to see that there's hope 
for the hopeless in verses 24 through 27. And finally, the glory of the cross in verses 28 through 30. We'll see just how far we'll get this morning. But if you will, let's go ahead and read it together. We'll start in verse 21. (coughs) And he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below and I am from above. You are from this world and I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who has sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these things I speak to the world. And they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, Then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. And as He spoke these things, many came to believe in Him. So the first aspect I want you to see in this passage is a warning to all unbelievers A warning to all unbelievers. Jesus begins in verse 21. He says, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Now I want you to notice that the first time Jesus used the expression in verse 21, he says sin singular. Sin singular. Okay? And later on, he says in verse 24, sins, plural. All right, what he's talking about here, the sins, singular. When they were dying in their sins, what sin is he talking about? He's talking about the sin of unbelief, right? They had plenty of evidence. They had plenty of evidence for Jesus being who he claimed to be, right? John has been emphasizing the signs of Jesus, John has been emphasizing the things that Jesus has been doing to prove his deity, to prove who he was. Right? He's been ministering about this time, just to give you the timeline. Jesus spent a year in Galilee, he spent a year, sorry, a year in Judea, then he went to Galilee, he spent a year and a half there, now he's come back to Judea, and he has six months left to live. Okay? All of Israel has been talking about Jesus. He's what everybody talks about, right? No one taught like he taught. The scribes and the Pharisees, they always quoted somebody else. So-and-so rabbi says this about the Old Testament. And this rabbi says this about the Old Testament. And we should do this because so-and-so says this. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't do that. He taught what the Bible says. He let the Word of God stand on its own. And then he declared revelation expressly from himself. You see this in the Sermon on the Mount. We see this even if you flip a page, most of you in your Bibles, to verse 46 of chapter 7. The, the Pharisees ask the temple guard, who are Levites, by the way. They're not just random, random hire rent cops or rent a policeman. They're, they're temple guard, they're Levites. They said, why didn't you arrest him? And they said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. So Jesus did many, many signs, many miracles. John says in the end of this book of his gospel, John 20, verse 30, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. In fact, later on, John 21, 25, the world itself could not contain the books to be written about Christ and His works while He was on this earth. So the, so the evidence for who Christ is, is overwhelming. Miracle after miracle after miracle. 
sign to, to prove and validate his teaching everywhere he went. You see, they have no excuse. The people, the Jewish people have no excuse. Pharisees have no excuse. They, they had the witness of John the Baptist proclaiming Christ. They have Jesus' own witness. His teaching and His signs. They see the blind, the sick, the lame healed. They have the witness of the Old Testament Scriptures. Jesus says in John 5 that the, the, you search the Scriptures, but the Scriptures speak of me. Ultimately, it comes down, when it comes down to it, it's a matter of the will. They loved their sin. They loved the darkness. They didn't want to come anywhere near the light. Jesus exposed their hypocrisy, their legalism, their self-righteousness, their worldliness. They loved their evil deeds. As John 3.19 says. They refused to believe what was right before their eyes. And when Jesus says, look, you will die in your sin. They, they didn't want to admit that they were sinners. They, wanted, they would never admit that. They would never say, I'm a sinner. Right? I'll give you a great example. Flip over to Luke 18. Luke 18. Verse 9. This is just... One small example of the way that the Pharisees thought about themselves. Jesus actually makes it a parable. Luke chapter 18 verse 9. And He told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And they viewed others with contempt. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of everything I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Right? The Pharisees, they would never admit that they were sinners. In fact, that's one of their condemnations of Christ, was that he was a friend of sinners. They, he hung out with sinners. Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Him to listen to Him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Right? What they don't realize and what they wouldn't admit is that everyone is a sinner. Right? Jesus spoke about this in the Sermon of the Mount. He said, It's not about your actions. That determine whether you're a sinner or not. It's this very fact that you have a sinful heart. And all of your actions flow from that sinful heart. You don't, you're not a murderer because you murder. But that murder started with anger. Right? And we justify our sin. Cain. He justified his anger to the point that he murdered his brother. Right? We don't commit adultery just by doing the act. We're guilty of the sin of adultery when we look lustfully upon someone who's not our spouse. Right? We, have a, we have a lying heart, a deceiving heart. We don't always tell the truth. We want what we want. Jesus was over and over teaching that, that sin begins in the heart because the heart is sinful. And the Pharisees would never admit that. They didn't want to go anywhere near the thought that they were sinners. Because if they were sinners, they'd have to deal with their sin. But they were self-righteous. And they loved it. By the way, in 1 John, to speak of the Apostle John's epistles, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin... Right? We don't we have a sinful nature. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
the truth was not in the Pharisees. They had no light. How about 1 John 1.10? If we say that we have not sinned, in other words, we haven't done anything wrong, we make who? We make God a liar and His truth is not in us. So basically the Pharisees are what? They have no truth and they're calling Christ a liar because Christ keeps saying, look, you're sinners. And Christ says very clearly, you will die in your sin, your unbelief. Right? He's not talking about, by the way, physical death. Physical death is a consequence of the fall. It's a, it's a natural consequence. Consequence, excuse me. We all are born. We all die. Right? That's part of the curse of sin. He's talking about judgment in hell. This is an Old Testament phrase. To die in your sins is, a, is to be in judgment, be under the judgment of God in hell. That's what he's talking about. Right? You're, not a, you're not annihilated. You spend forever in hell. And that's what Christ is saying in this one sentence. Well, if belief equals eternal life, unbelief equals disobedience and equals judgment. John 3, 36. I'll continue to quote this. It's such a pointed passage. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides upon him. Right? How do we obey Christ? How are they disobedient? Well, Christ says, Christ has called us all, called all men to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. He said in this passage, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, he says, believe in me. To to not believe in the gospel is to be disobedient and deserving of God's wrath. Because that's the ultimate point for these Pharisees, is it's unbelief. Right? There is that aspect of human responsibility. We, we love to emphasize the sovereignty of God, and rightfully so, but there is the aspect of human responsibility in Scripture. The truths are intention. They are responsible for their sin. They are responsible for believing in Christ. And they had much evidence. They had no reason not to believe, if you put it that way. Unbelief is inexcusable. One thing about what Jesus says, look, I will go away and you will seek me. He's saying, I'm going away. Where is he going? Right? He's, he's going back to the Father. He's going back where he came from. Right? He's talking about his exaltation as the Son of God. And look what he says. He says, you cannot come. The word there is dunamis. We get our word dynamite. Right? He's saying, you don't have the power to follow me. Excuse me. You don't have the ability. In other words, they can't go to heaven on their own. There's no ability for the, for the natural man, the unregenerate person to get into heaven. They don't have that ability. He said, you can't follow me. And Nicodemus had to learn this the hard way. When he came to Jesus in his conversation in John chapter 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you're regenerated by the Holy Spirit. He said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? He says, you can't even understand spiritual truth because you're blind and you're in darkness. And then in verse 5, he says to Nicodemus, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, same thing means born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It takes a work of of God in your heart to regenerate you, to to wash you clean of your sin, to forgive your sin, to reconcile you with, with Himself through Jesus Christ for you to enter into heaven. So Jesus says, I'm going away. And He says, you can't come. You don't have that ability. This is Jesus. Jesus is clamping down the warning. He's escalating this with the Pharisees. This chapter is an escalation. When we get to the very end of this chapter, hey, they're going to pick up stones to stone Jesus. 
This is an escalation. And he says, look, you're, you're going to seek me. All right, this runs parallel to John chapter 7, verse 34, which he says, you will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come, right? He says that kind of in a nicer way. Now he's saying, look, you're going to die in your sin of unbelief. He said, and you'll seek me. Well, where are they? Right? If they're going to seek Christ and He's in heaven, where are they? They are in hell. And there is the reality of hell. Okay? I preached a sermon on this. You can go back and, and look. We preached on John 7, 734 passage. I preached in detail about the horrors of hell, the reality of hell. But just to remind you, it's a fire that never burns out. It's a darkness in which there is no light. It's a pain that will never stop in which the, the worm does not die. And the thirst is not quenched. It's the everlasting and everyday torment of a guilty conscience. It's the regret of not believing in Christ. And it's the unfulfilled desire of God's mercy and grace that will never happen. There's no hope for those in hell. There's no purgatory. There's no praying for saints. There's no drop a penny or drop a, drop a coin into the uh, pot and from purgatory springs, as they would say in the Middle Ages. I mean, that's where they are. They're in hell. And they're going to search and they will seek Christ and they will ask for God's mercy and His grace and they would not be given to them. Because there is no excuse for unbelief in this life. I want you to see evidence. Look in verse 22. Evidence of this unbelief. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot go. You see, this is a mocking. They're mocking Jesus. Right? They're mocking the Son of God. Right? Is he going to commit suicide? For those of you, I was talking to Jordan about it. Remember the old MASH theme song? Dun, 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 dun. I'm not going to sing it. Yeah, if you look in the original MASH movie, the, 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 the words to the song were meant to be shocking. They basically say, suicide is painless. They, uh, it's, they, they, the whole song is a joke. Well, when they made the TV show, they decided that was a little bit too aggressive. And so they took the, the words out and the theme song became pretty famous. What they're saying over here, now the Jews believed suicide was the worst sin that you could do. Right? If you committed suicide, there was a special place in Sheol, and basically in the bottom of hell, in darkness, that was reserved for you. And so I want you to, I want you to get what they're saying to Jesus now. I want, you to, I want you to think about this. Okay? If Jesus is saying, I'm going where you can't go. And they're saying, well, you're not going to the bottom of Sheol, are you? All right, you're going to commit suicide. All right? Now think about this. This is, this is pride. We know where we're going. We're going to heaven. We're going to God's presence. So you're not going to the bottom of Sheol, are you? You're going as far away from us. And if we can't go there, that's why we can't go. Because we'll be with God. We'll be in His presence. And you're going to commit suicide. And you're going to go to the deepest part of hell. See the pride? The mocking tone? The self-righteousness? That's the Pharisees. They had this, this prideful attitude. They were, they were self-righteous. They were self-sufficient. They, they had self-esteem. Parents, the worst thing in the world you can teach your kids is self-esteem. Because they already have it. They already, what self-esteem? Self-esteem is, is just a synonym for self-love. We love ourselves. We don't need to love ourselves more. The Bible says we love others as more important than ourselves. We love God more important than ourselves. Kids don't need more self-esteem. They need to understand their sinful heart so that they can cry out to God and ask Him to save them. Like we all did. We had to, what? Be humbled. Right? We had to lose our pride. So these Pharisees have this attitude of self-superiority. They, they don't need Jesus. We're, we're good enough for heaven. 
Right? They trusted in their own ethnicity as Jews. Hey, we're God's people. We got it made. Right? We get to go to heaven. We get, a, we get an express ticket, first class. We're good enough for heaven. They, they trusted in their own, their own morality, their own goodness, their own righteousness. They thought their religious activity was, was good enough to earn them God's favor. Hey, Lord, we do all the sacrifices. We follow the law. We're good. We're going to get in heaven. Jesus, how dare you say that we're going to die in our sin? We're going to heaven. So you must be going to hell, the deepest parts where we can't go. Romans 10, 3, for being ignorant of righteousness of God, Paul says this about the Jews, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. Paul says in Romans 10, 3, that that's the, that's the Jewish problem still, even today, as they, they try to establish their own righteousness, their own right standing before God, apart from the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right? That, that's the solas. We're saved, what? By grace alone. Right? We're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Justified is to, to be declared righteous. Right? Christ Im, imputes us. God imputes us Christ's righteousness. So when God looks upon us, He sees the righteousness of Christ. We believe in Him. It's part of that transaction. He redeems us from our sin. He forgives us. He reconciles us. And He imputes His righteousness to us. By grace, through faith. And that's everyone in this world, by the way. Everyone in this world is prideful, self-righteous, self-justifying, full of self-esteem. Right? And by the way, people will justify anything. It doesn't matter how many facts you give them. You can tell them that, hey, drinking this will kill you. Smoking this will kill you. It doesn't matter. They're going to do it anyway. Right? Yeah, I, you know, I can see a heartbeat in my womb, but I'm still going to kill this baby because it's inconvenient. People justify everything because our hearts ultimately are wicked or sinful. We're self-justifying creatures. Even as Christians, we struggle with the flesh. Our first instinct is to justify ourselves, right? To, to declare ourselves right. To, to whatever we did, there's a reason for it. Honey, I, I'm sorry for, for uh, yelling at you, but I was tired. Honey, I, I'm sorry for, for, uh, for, for not being there when I told you I was going to be there, but... right. There's a reason. Right? I'm sorry for not talking kindly to the kids, but, it, oh, but you know, I had a rough day. I'm sorry for, for loving and, and wanting all these possessions, Lord, but man, I, you know, I need them to make me happy. We, we don't want to admit that. We're always self-justifying. That's the world we live in. It's a self-justification, self, full of self-justification, excuse me, full of self-righteousness, self-sufficiency, self-esteem. It's pride. And this is evidence in the Pharisees are showing this. Right? He's not gonna, you're not gonna kill yourself, are you? <laughs> That's what he's gonna do. We're going to heaven. He's gonna be way down there in hell. And by the way, when Jesus, Jesus continues and He says, not only are they prideful, but He said they have a worldly mindset. Look in verse 23. And He was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world and I am not of this world. Jesus is pointing out their difference. Right? Their, their attitude towards Him demonstrates their, their unbelief, their pride, and also their worldliness, their worldly mindset. By the way, when he speaks about the world here, he's not just talking about, hey, you're born on this earth, right? He's talking about all of fallen humanity in rebellion against God. Right? We saw a beautiful rainbow not too long ago, riding in the car. My daughter said, oh, look, Dad, a rainbow. And we were looking at the rainbow, Right? That's, that's the, the earth that we live in. Christ isn't talking about the physical nature of this world and the hills and the mountains and the trees and the sea. He's not, he's not talking about that when He says you're of the world. 
The word here, the word here in the Greek is cosmos, right? Cosmos is the opposite of chaos. Cosmos means order or structure. He's talking about the, the structured system that we live in. 1 John 5.19 says the cosmos, the world, lies in the power of Satan. So you think about this. Everything in this cosmos, this system, this world we live in, is antithetical to Christ, antithetical to Christians, antithetical and opposed to God, His Word, right? That's the world we live in. That's why Christ says it's in darkness. The world hates God. The world hates Christ. The world hates Christians. Hates the Bible. Hates the truth. Hates the church. Right? Common wisdom will never equal truth. Right? Because common wisdom can't answer life's questions. Why are you here? What's your purpose? Where did you come from? Where are you going? Why do you feel guilty? Because God says in Romans, or Paul says in Romans, that you've been given a conscience. God's written the law in your heart. Why do you feel guilty when you do things? How do you answer those questions, those, those life questions? The world has plenty of answers, but they're not the truth. It's common wisdom. By the way, this world that we live in is opposed to the church. If it can divide the church. It can prevent us from meeting. Prevent the Word of God from being proclaimed. It will try to do that. Right? All governments in this world are satanically energized. Even if they don't know it. And most of them don't know it. They're not like they get together in a, in a big conspiracy theorist kind of, kind of uh, idea and say, alright, well, we're worshiping Satan. What does Satan want us to do? No! They're just part of this world. And the world is, is heading, as, as Peter actually says, the world is heading down a flood of dissipation. Of wastefulness, just a, a flood. That's, that's the world. Everything is, is affected. So when governments pass laws to, that hinder the church and persecute the church, even if that's not the, the, the primary result, but the secondary result, it's all in Satan's designs. We have to understand that. But we're still told to respect those in government, not talk bad about our leaders, as Alex pointed out earlier. Right? We're, to, we're to submit to government. But remember, no, no authority is absolute except for Christ's. My authority as an elder is not absolute. Fathers, your authority is not absolute. The government's authority is not absolute. We live in a corrupt world. A world, it's demoralizing. Right? It's fake. It's fickle. And it's self-focused. People, what's the primary pursuit of almost all people you talk to? They don't want to quite say it so bluntly, but they want to do what makes them happy. That's what people's pursuits are. I want to do what makes me happy. Right? What makes me feel good. What satisfies my flesh is really what they're, they're saying. So Jesus is drawing that contrast. He's, you know, he, he says, you're, you're consumed by the things of the world. You're from below. You can see that in how you respond in unbelief. You're consumed by selfish ambition, selfish pleasure, self-entertainment, self-justification. You're satisfied by the things of this world. They love their positions of prominence. Right? The people, the, the common people looked up to them. They thought, thought well of them, even though they didn't deserve that esteem. And in their unbelief, they demonstrate their allegiance. And their allegiance is to the world, to lies. Right? Later on, we're going to talk about this. They, Jesus plainly tells them, your father's the devil. But that's it. There's only two types of people in this world, by the way. John says this in 1 John. Jesus says it here in chapter 8. There's those that are children of God and the children of Satan. And we were children of wrath, children of Satan, until God transferred us, as Colossians says, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His Son. But He's drawing that contrast. He says, I'm from above. I love the Father. You don't. He said earlier, if you remember, you don't even know the Father. Because if you knew the Father, you'd, you'd accept me and believe in me. He's drawing that contrast. 
And as believers, look, we're, we're commanded in 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the cosmos, the love of the Father is not in them. Evidence for your salvation is what and whom do you love, right? Do you have that worldly mindset? All that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Everything in this world can be categorized like that. Used to have people ask me, well, how, how can you relate to teenagers? Especially when you get in your 30s and you're still doing student ministries. How can you relate to these teenagers? What do you mean? They struggle with the same thing everybody else struggles with. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Right? The sins of this world. Now, they're in different forms, but that's what this world has to offer. But as believers, we're to be different. I preached a sermon recently on Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. In Colossians 3, Paul tells the Colossians, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, in other words, if you've been born again, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are of this earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Right? Your affections, your mindset should be set on the things above and not on this world. Unless you think you can go to this world and not be, hey, well, you know, if I, if I just don't talk about Christ too much, maybe if I, if I just kind of live my life, I can go under the radar. Maybe the world won't notice me. Maybe, maybe I can still indulge in some things and, and nobody really notices me. I read an article the other day. It said that if, if you believe in a seventh-day creation, then you have all the hallmarks of a conspiracy theorist. Right? This is in a, in a major news magazine in the U.S. Right? So if you believe the Bible, you're a conspiracy theorist. You see, that's, our new, that's the new term. That's the new racists. Right? When I grow up, if you wanted to impugn somebody, you wanted to discount what they wanted to say, or what, no, matter, no matter how weighty it was, how many facts they would give you, they would just say, oh, you're a racist. Right? And that's like the worst thing somebody can say, oh, I'm a racist. Because then, you know, you're, you're basically a Nazi, so I don't have to listen to you. Right? So it's just a way, of, a way of, of shutting down arguments. People impugn you, and then they can dismiss with whatever you say, no matter how much truth there is. Right? That's what they do to Jesus, by the way. They call him a, a blasphemer. They say he's going, he's going to the hell, we're going to heaven. Right? Just to, oh, well, well, we just dismiss him. He's a Galilean. Like, he's from Port Pirie. Right? So they impugn you, but the, 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 the whole idea of conspiracy theorists, that's the, that's the modern day. Like, oh, those are just, they're, they're Christians. Oh, they're just, those are just conspiracy theorists. All right? We can dismiss what they have to say. Right? You're, you're racist. Or they'll call us homophobes, religious zealots. Um, anti-vaxxer is a new one, right? Whatever it is, they, they, they label you as a, as a particular term and then they can dismiss whatever you have to say, right? That's what they do to Jesus. But that, if you think you can go through this world without any opposition, you're wrong. And if you are going through this world without any opposition at all, the question really is, do you look like Christ at all? Are you really even a believer? I mean, do people in your work know that you're a Christian? Have you told them? Right? When things come up and they ask you to do certain things or ask you your opinion on certain things, are you willing to even speak up and say, well, you know, I live my life by what the Word of God says. And, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't go and party with you guys on the weekends. Or, no, I don't think like that. You know? When they talk bad about their wives, do you join in? Are their husbands at work? Or do you say, look, I'm going to show my husband respect, or I'm going to show my wife respect. Are you different? Look, apart from Christ, everyone loves the world they live in. They don't know that they're in darkness, right? If everybody's in darkness together, then how, how do they find out? It takes someone in the light shining a light. Hey, you're in darkness. Look out. Look, everybody loves the world. They're ignorant. They're blinded. But they're still responsible for their sin. Responsible for their unbelief. 
All their power, their possessions, their religious activity will gain them nothing but a future in hell. Believers, I guess the challenge for us is to remember that the world is darkness. Friendship with the world is enemy, enmity with God. They are incompatible. What fellowship does light have with darkness? How will your unbelieving friends know the truth if you're not willing to share it with them? I can't be there with your work, right? I can't, I can't go to your family gatherings. Right? It's your responsibility. Tell the people that you know, that you love, if you actually care about them, the truth. And know that Jesus says, look, I've come to bring a sword. The truth offends. And it's hard. We don't want to, we don't want to offend family and risk, risk causing separation. It's, but sin separates. Sin divides. And it's not that they're rejecting you. They're rejecting the light. Remember, the darkness hates the light. Because when you talk about sin, they don't want to hear that they're sinners. They don't want to hear that they're, they're in unbelief. And that, I mean, have you ever said to somebody, you will die in your sins? It's pretty tough. But it's the truth. Let's continue. In verse 34, Jesus says, I said to you, you will die in your sins. Notice it's plural this time. Right? It's not singular unbelief. It's sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So there's hope. So what do you do with a world of darkness? A world that, that's full of unbelief. A world that's going to hell in a handbasket, as we used to say when I was growing up. What, what, do, you, what do you do with a world where there's hope? Right? Jesus says that if you believe, you will... What? Die in your sins unless you believe that I am. Take out the he, that he was added in. Unless you believe that I am. And by the way, he says you'll die in your sins. You know all sin proceeds from the sin of unbelief, right? Think about it. What was Eve's first sin? Right? She wanted to be God. She didn't believe his promises for right, blessing. She didn't believe his promise of judgment. If she, if she didn't obey, she wanted to be God. Unbelief crept into her heart and her pride. She led her husband and they did the same thing, both of them. They, they, they sinned against God. They declared they knew what was best for them as unbelief. Unbelief leads to all series of manners of sins. When you reject Christ, you harden your hearts. You go farther down the road of unbelief and their sin is multiplied in your life. He said, you'll die in your sins, all your sins. But there is hope because it comes down to one thing. Belief in one person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. It's hope. There's relief from sin. Right? There's a satisfaction of God's judgment by Himself. Because Jesus is the light. John 3, 16, God is given the Son. What? If you believe in Him, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. Instead of perishing in your sin, dying in your sin, you instead have forgiveness for your sin. Reconciliation with God. Because Christ died on the cross in our place. It's called substitutionary atonement. There you go, it's for Jordan in the back, and it's theological studies, right? It's, the, it's a theological term, and Christ substituted Himself in our spot and made atonement for our sin, right? He satisfied God's wrath. So instead of you facing the wrath of God because of your sin, Christ paid that price. He had the wrath of God poured upon Himself. And because He was a perfect sacrifice, sinless his righteousness is imputed to us. So that when God looks upon us, when we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for our sins, when we believe that, the Holy Spirit regenerates us, He reconciles us to God, He forgives us of our sins, and He joins us together in one body, the church. There's hope. And by the way, Jesus says, believe that I am. If you don't think the Jews understood at least somewhat what he was getting at, 
Right? This escalates until the very end of this chapter when Jesus says basically the same phrase one more time and they pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. That's where we get to verse 25. Who are you? In other words, did we catch you right? Are you saying what we, we think you're saying? Unless you believe that I am the, the Old Testament name for Yahweh? God speaks to Moses in the burning bush and Moses and he tells Moses, I want you to go deliver my people. And I'm going to be with you and we're going to, we're going to judge. I'm going to judge the nation of Egypt and, and we're going to do mighty miracles and bring the people out of Egypt, out of bondage. And Moses asks a real good question. Well, who should I tell him that is telling me to go do this? Right? In other words, what, what should I call you? And God says, tell him I am sent you. I am who I am. Right? The Jews have taken that phrase and they've, they've shortened it to, we, we call it Yahweh. The Tetragrammon. And Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. I saw this, <coughs> saw this uh, news article in John MacArthur's commentary on the book of John. And John MacArthur relates this story that he read in a Melbourne, Australia newspaper. I thought it was pretty appropriate. It says that after Billy Graham preached in Melbourne, he read an article in a, in a daily paper, and it says, quote, After hearing Billy Graham and viewing him on television and seeing reports and letters concerning his mission here, I am heartily sick of the type of religion that insists my soul, and everyone else's need saving, whatever that means. I've never felt that I was lost, nor did I feel that I daily wallow in the mire of sin, although repetitious preaching insists that I do. Give me a practical religion that teaches gentleness and tolerance and acknowledges no barriers of color or creed, that remembers the aged and teaches children goodness and not sin. If in order to save my soul, I must accept such a philosophy as I have heard recently preach, I prefer to remain forever damned. And he signed his name. And he got his wish. Look, for for all those in darkness, there's only one light. That's Jesus Christ. There's a warning here for all those who are mired in unbelief. You will die in your sins. And you will face an eternity in hell. And all the torments that go with it. But Jesus says, look, there is a way. There is hope. He says, follow me. Believe in me. He is the Savior of the world. The only Savior of the world. He is the only light. And as we'll discuss soon, He is the way, the truth, and the life. The question is, if you're listening here today or online, do you believe, first of all, you're a sinner? Do you understand that the Bible says that for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God? Because if you want to accept the fact that you're a sinner, then you're mired in your own self-righteousness and you're self-justifying your, your, your actions before God. You're a sinner and you need a Savior because apart from the saving grace of God, you are bound for judgment and the wrath of God abides upon you. Brethren, I guess the question for those of you that, that are believers, that have repented and confessed your sins and that do believe in Christ, does your life look like it? Right? Yeah, you've humbled yourself, you've asked for forgiveness, you've been born again, but yet you're still playing footsie. We use that term in the South. You play footsie with sin, right? I don't even know what footsie is. You're under the table, the girl you like, you kind of play footsie with her, nobody can see, nobody knows what you're doing, right? You're playing footsie with sin under the table and nobody sees it, right? You think you can get away with it. You, you love this world, And it's seen clearly in where you spend your money, where you spend your time, where you devote yourself to. 
You hang out more with unbelievers or believers? Who do you love? You love God. You love His people. You love His church. I always make this as a joke, but it's true. You might as well get to know people now because you're going to know them for all eternity. Right? How terrible it would be you go to heaven and, and you're around all these saints and all, they were in my church, but I really don't really know them that well. What's your time consumed with? It shows what you love. Look, there's a warning to unbelievers here. And there's hope for the hopeless. We'll deal with the rest of the passage next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank You for Your Word. What a great warning, a great challenge it is even for us who believe to, to walk worthy of our calling, to know that the world we live in is in darkness and will die in its sin. What a hopeless situation. A situation that can only be remedied by the light that comes from Jesus Christ. I pray for those here that may have heard your gospel message and don't know you, that don't believe yet, that are mired in their own unbelief and self-justification. I pray that they would be convicted by you, Holy Spirit, in regard to their sin and their lack of righteousness and in the, the judgment that awaits. I pray that you would draw them to Christ, that they may see His glories and see that following Him is a wonderful thing, is not a burden. And they may be saved. For those of us that have known you for a while and whatever time frame, I pray, Lord, that we would live a life that demonstrates that that is a light in this dark world. That shows that we have a love for you and not a worldliness. Help us to be quick to forgive, to be slow to justify our own sin, to, to battle the flesh when the temptation arises. I pray, Lord, that you would use us for your glory. May we be the salt and light in this dark world. We thank you again for your word. We praise your name. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.